I'm going to, my talk is composed two parts, concentrating on biomarkers uh, and aiding clinicians and aiding us in antibiotic stewardship, uh, as well as maybe, maybe triaging of patients. Uh, so the first part is on procalcitonin, the second part I move to a new biomarker, or relatively new biomarker, it's called proadrenomodulin. I put my uh, disclosures uh, here. Um, so why we care? We care about antibiotic resistance because uh, why we care about antibiotics? Antibiotic resistance on the rise um, because a huge amount of toxicity and interactions and, and they are very costly um, to our um, NHS uh, resources. Um, how many prescribers are here? And just raise hands please. Uh, how many of us give antibiotics just in case every now and then? Yeah, two of us? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, um, this was a survey among 150 intensivists and microbiologists or infectious disease specialists in Wessex. And I se sent a survey monkey questionnaire. It, it had other qu questions in it, but one of them is do we give antibiotic just in case? And 91% um, said yeah. And uh, more often than what we think, in fact, when you look at our practices. Um, I had a very good colleague, He's, he, he left uh, to the Middle East now, he's a microbiologist, he said to me, I like your questionnaire, but I didn't reply to it. And I said, why? He said, because SurveyMonkey is not an anonymous survey. And I said, no, it's anonymous, I don't know. He said, no, come on, i show you. So he showed me who the answers are from. And the ones they said no, seriously, I worked with all of them. And they all give antibiotics, just in case, <laughs> on my watch. Sometimes two antibiotics. So they give a gram negative, just in case, and then they say, oh, let's give it tycoplanin, just in case this is uh, uh, an MRC or something. So we all do it. Just ruin all future <laughs> 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 um, And uh, I'm not going to go in detail to this, but there are data suggesting about 20 to 50% of antibiotics are unnecessary. In, in human health, and uh, um, the, the, the CDC, they say 86% of patients presenting with pneumonia have a viral or no pathogen isolated. So there is a huge amount of unnecessary use antibiotics. So if we and, and or just in case antibiotics, clinician, yeah. Um, so we thought um, in 2009, can we integrate biomarkers to antibiotic decision making, and. Uh, we had a very good stewardship in, in Winchester um, based on the point prevalence data. We were sometimes below the average national use for antibiotic usage or mortality wasn't higher than the, the average mortality you see in, in other NHS hospitals similar to ours. Um, and we looked at the biomarkers and we said, which one? Which biomarker to look at? And we, we searched with uh, colleagues and uh, with the help of the university. and, and we, we thought of procalcitonin. Let's try procalcitonin because um, at that time, um, it's not a golden bullet, by the way. It was more sensitive based on the data, so it's more sensitive and specific than other markers uh, for bacterial infection, at least. Just for those who are not familiar, it's a peptide produced um, by the C cells of the thyroid. And soon after its production, it gets converted to calcitonin and catacalcin. And calcitonin, we know uh, part of its function in bone metabolism, but nobody knows what catacalcin does. And nobody knows exactly what's the function of procalcitonin in healthy individuals. Some say it's uh, um, a, a neurotransmitter or maintainer of vascular tone, but nobody knows uh, what does it do. And then uh, when we looked at um, the, the studies about dynamics, we saw this data, and, and we have replicated this data in clinical cases in, in our hospital. I'll show some slides later. If time zero, if you induce sepsis in time zero, and, and, you, and you look for, for, for the rise of these biomarkers, uh, if you see CRP here, I don't know, there's not, not a pointer, it takes about 48 hours to peak. So nowadays when I go to intensive care unit and Dr. Arthur Goldsmith said to me, Kodo, the CRP has gone up. I, my immediate question is what happened 48 hours ago? So it's not a real time. We, f we found these markers are uh, more rising in real time, but it's really difficult to measure. They're labile. Any biochemists among us? No biochemists? No? Um, they're very labile. 
So they degrade due to proteases very rapidly. So you have to measure them in, in the within an hour, ideally. And um, interleukin-6, which is probably the most recent biomarker and, and infection, there are no defined cutoffs for interleukin-6. And um, some studies say 9 picogram per liter. Above Anything above that is significant. Some say it's 12. Uh, recently, I've seen 50, so quite a range. And uh, uh, even if you look at healthy individuals, depending on their, their mood or the day of part of the day, of whether it's nice or whether it's horrible, they could have uh, different interleukin-6 uh, levels. But procalcitonin, we thought, actually, it rises more or less in real time. It peaks quicker than the CRP. And studies have showed more sensitive and specific than CRP for bacterial infection. Let's try that to see if it helps us uh, in our antibiotic decision making. And I'm just showing this paper. Procalcitonin, the pathway for procalcitonin is um, immune pathway what one, or, or it's like a bacterial pathway, depending on interleukin and um, too many necrotic factor alpha. And that triggers the, the rise of procalcitonin, while viral infections, the gamma interferon, in fact, inhibits the rise of procalcitonin, and hence is more specific for bacterial infection compared to, to viral infection. And this study showed this, this is all viral, viral infection only. Um, this is bacterial infection or superseding bacterial infection after viral infection. It's interesting, these ones, they have higher procalcitonin. We see that in clinical practice during the flu season. Patients come in with flu, you think they're getting better two days down the line, they're worse, then you measure the procalcitonin, has gone up. So that's a super, super bacterial infection or superseding bacterial infection. <coughs> and I said in healthy individuals, the main producers uh, of thyroid cells and to some extent small cells in the lung. But the amount of it is really, because it's converted uh, uh, to calcitonin and catechalcin, we cannot detect it in the blood. So the levels are undetectable. But once you have a sepsis uh, if you see this this uh, uh, picture on this side, sorry, the point is here. Almost every single tissue in the body starts to produce procalcitonin, and you have huge amount of spillage, and we, we will be able to measure it in, in the serum, and we could give you a value. That's why in localized infection, when the infection is localized, you might not see the rise of procalcitonin in the blood. So you might get a false negative. So localized infection, you wouldn't see a localized bacterial infection. You may not see a rise in procalcitonin. Um, I mentioned about role in healthy individuals, not clear. How about, how about role in infection? Again, it's not very clear. Some um, uh, say it's a bad marker for infection. So the more you have, the, the worse the outcome. And animal studies in rats and pigs uh, where they induce sepsis uh, in, in those animals and they challenge them with anti-procalcitonin antibodies, either during the early phase of sepsis or due to premorbid mortalities improved almost 100% in those who were given the anti-procalcitonin antibodies. But as far as I know, there hasn't been any therapeutic attempts or, 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 or tests in human to see if you could give it to a septic patient whether they reverse it or not. This is just um, uh, a, a meta-analysis of, of studies just to show it's more sensitive and more specific than CRP, but we're still making decision on a daily basis based on a CRP uh, to stop antibiotics or start antibiotics. This is in the context of the clinical picture, but we have a better marker that we're not using. Another systematic review in ED, uh, this is from Holland. Holland's a very small country, but they come out with the very great studies. So this is from Holland. Usage of procalcitonin in ED to see if it aids antibiotic uh, stewardship. Um, uh, they have shown in adults, they have reduced the number of antibiotic days. They have uh, reduced the side effects uh, that we get from antibiotics, uh, but not in pediatrics. They are very limited studies. Uh, generally, in my experience, at least in our hospital, 
the antibiotic stewardship among pediatricians, in my experience, very good. And that's why even in our hospital, we haven't pushed it to the pediatric side because I don't think we would improve uh, beyond, beyond what we are doing now. Maybe, I don't know. This is another study from Holland, an ICU multi-center study. Um, I put this, this is because it's really interesting to me. It says 1,500 patients, half in the procalcitonin arm, half in the traditional arm. Uh, and they looked at the antibiotic. They reduced the antibiotic days by two days. They reduced the side effects. Uh, but for the first time, there was better survival, both 28-day survival and a one-year survival among the procalcitonin group. So again, not, not effect, or in fact, positive effect on improving morta mortality. No effect on increasing mortality. They looked at the cost. And they did it on every single case that attended the ITU. And they say for that to be cost effective, it has to cost four euros. And that's not the case. So we thought we will bring procalcitonin to our antibiotic stewardship. And we sat down with our colleagues in MAU, Martin Ada Kim, and uh, colleagues in ICU. And we said, this is a better marker for <coughs> in bacterial infection. But it has certain cutoffs based on the studies that we reviewed. So if you are in MAU patients and you have a cutoff more than 0.25, that could suggest good suggestive of bacterial infection. Same patient in ICU, the cutoff goes up to 0.5. A patient postoperatively, you could have a physiological rise after the operation, could go up to 2 microgram per liter, and uh, acute pancreatitis patients, 4. And we decided to use procalcitonin to help us avoid just in case antibiotics. So if you are certain you have an infection or bacterial infection, please go ahead and treat your patient. If you're certain the patient does not have bacterial infection, again, don't give antibiotics. But those category that say the clinician is not sure. Um, is it an infection or is it a bacterial infection? But I'll give antibiotic just in case. We say let's use procalcitonin. And if it is below the certain cutoff, please try to withhold antibiotics. Um, and we monitor the patient. You could change your mind. If, if your patient deteriorates, you could change your mind and give the antibiotics. Or you could measure the procalcitonin again to see whether it's the trend in up or, or down. And then you could change your decision. Uh, so this is a six-month period evaluation, 9 to 5. At that time, we used to <coughs> the test 9 to 5 in microbiology. And uh, the just-in-case category for, 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 for that period were 99 patients. So I call it 100 patients. And in 33 here, the procalcitonin was above the cutoff, and the clinicians gave antibiotics. In 52 cases, which is about 50%, it was below the cutoff, and the clinicians didn't give antibiotics. They withhold antibiotics. In 14 cases, the procalcitonin was low, but the clinicians still gave antibiotics. When we monitored these patients, to see how many we have killed just because we deny them antibiotics over the seven days or the entire stays. None. So no and none of them received a second course of antibiotic or a, a course of antibiotic within that seven days. So these are the just, just in case. And we tried the same in ICU. Um, in MAU, in medical admission unit, each patient received, had one measurement of procalcitonin. So interesting, nobody received, uh, repeated their procalcitonin measurement. In ICU, on average, there were two tests per patient. And if you look at the test per patient, 50-50, 50% of the time we didn't give antibiotics, 50% of the time we gave antibiotics. Unfortunately, four patients died during the evaluation period but they were all in the high procalcitonin group. And they were all on antibiotics deemed to be appropriate. So again, we didn't kill anyone or cause harm to anyone uh, by denying them antibiotics, the just-in-case antibiotics. And if you look at our ICNARC data, um, in fact, mortality is improved. I'm not saying it's because of procalcitonin, but there are lots of other, other measures in ICU. But we have an increased mortality because we are denying antibiotics based on the marker within a clinical context. These are the cases 
So now it was the, 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 the evaluation was 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, on one side just MAU and ICU. Now it's rolled out throughout the hospital, apart from pediatrics. And uh, uh, we do it 24-7 in biochemistry. So it's available 24-7. These are groups of uh, potentially infected and potentially non-infected. The infected ones in red uh, and non-infected. So look at the CRP, almost identical. These are median values. Um, white cell, again, almost identical. The procalcitonin, there's a stark difference. Uh, these are large numbers of, of patients. I haven't done stats to see if it is statistically significant, but it's quite a large number of, of patients group. You see how high the PCT is in the potentially infected. These are clinicians. We are not sure whether this is an infection or not. Um, for stopping antibiotic, we use it for stopping antibiotic uh, across the hospital. So this is the red arrow is a timeline where we gave antibiotic and then serial measurements, day one, day three, day five. And as you see the blue line, the bottom line, that's the procalcitonin coming down to baseline level. CRP and white cell count still uh, n n not, not necessarily in the, in the right base, base, baseline level. So again, aid, aiding us to stop antibiotics. I mentioned this case. This is an acute pancreatitis case. An intensivist here? Yeah? yeah, intensivist. So this patient admitted to ICU 6th of July with uh, acute pancreatitis, 42-year-old. Uh, the cutoff for pancreatitis is 4 microgram per liter. Um, as you see, white, white cell and the red bar, almost 20. CRP, 170. Spike in temperature. The yellow triangle is procalcitonin. The surgeons are pushing for antibiotic. The microbiologist and the intensivist say, no, this is an inflammatory response. Let's not give antibiotics. So we decided we would base the decision on procalcitonin. So the procalcitonin was below 4. We didn't give antibiotics. This patient, two days later or three days later, went to have a pseudocyst drain. So they drained the pseudocyst. Return back to ICU, white cell counts down, CRP is down, spike in temperature, the surgeons want antibiotic. We said, let's do progalstonin again to see whether we could give antibiotic, or well, we need to give antibiotic. Again, it's below the four. It's gone up. If you remember, I mentioned surgery can lead to physiological rise, or maybe you could call pathological rise of progalstonin. We still didn't give antibiotic. This patient stayed for about eight weeks in ICU without a single course of antibiotic. Each time measurement was due to a spike or a rise of CRP white cell or something happened clinically and someone was pushing for antibiotics and we didn't. It's interesting, the pseudocyst drain grew pseudomonas and we still didn't give antibiotics. This patient's still alive. Yeah? I would argue with so, so, so some, some, some people say, oh, you are stupid. Some people say, oh, you're brave, whatever. But at this time point, a, a, a strong surgeon could have pushed for antibiotics here, or maybe here, and would have been tazosin. And then spike temperature, or the CRP has gone up here, they would have converted to meropenem. And here, would have an antifungal would have been added here. So I think this patient just speaks for itself. And this is just... This is not an extreme example. We have many examples like this. In fact, we have seen in patients who get antibiotics, especially in elderly, confused elderly, um, queer UTI, the PCT group, they have higher mortality. The high PCT group, they have higher mortality compared to the ones that low PCT and we don't give them antibiotics. So that's, again, just anecdotal. So regarding cost, I mentioned the Dutch group say it has to cost four euro. For us, it costs about 10 pound a test. If you use it in every single case, it would be the least cost-effective test, and it will become probably the least useful test because you would use the, your negative and positive predictive value if you use it as a box-ticking exercise. Like blood cultures, we don't take blood cultures on every single patient that comes to ED. There are certain parameters. We say take a blood culture with a spike in temperature or infection suspe suspected. I think... For us, if you use it for stewardship as a trend, in ICU it would be a best good place. In, in, um, um, for uh, just-in-case antibiotic, it's really good, especially if you are observing the patient while you are denying antibiotic. But otherwise, if you use it for every single case, it's not be cost-effective. And when we calculated the 
just in case, those just in case antibiotics <coughs> that we have avo avoided, it was one out of five to one out of six antibiotic courses. So going back to the 20% of antibiotics are not necessary. So otherwise, these patients would have had those antibiotics. The managers like this because when we calculated the cost of antibiotics versus the cost of the procalcitonin and the cost of the saving by not giving antibiotics, the net saving was about £60,000 for six months in MAU and ICU. And that's what they like. They say, oh, let's bring it in. But for us, most important patients, were not, we didn't get antibiotics. And probably we have saved bed days, nursing time, opportunity costs. I think Tom mentioned opportunity costs. IV lines, uh, pharmacy time, so all were very, very important to us. And sadly, some, some, some other savings we might not be, or we, we are not able to measure, like how many C. diffs we have prevented, how many IV lines infections we have prevented by not giving an IV antibiotic. Uh, <coughs> I mentioned the timeline, prediction of infection. We are a um, tertiary center in Basingstoke for C. myxoma surgery peritoneal malignancy. Um, we are one of the two big centers in, in England. And um, these patients come in with this peritoneal malignancy. They are taken to theater. On average, they have nine hour operation. They have intraoperative chemotherapy, heat chemotherapy. And invariably, they end up in ICU for 48 hours on average. And they have huge inflammatory response <coughs> after the operation. And it's really difficult to determine whether this inflammatory response is due to surgery or is it infection related. So they could get, end up on antibiotics. So we did a study and they do two or three operations or maybe four operations each week. So it's quite difficult to capture a large, to do a large study uh, in a short period of time. But in, a, in one year we looked at 50 patients, serial measurements. Um, we measured CRP day zero, day one, so immediately postoperatively, day three and day six. The gray line, the gray bar, is where we clinically diagnosed infection. Microbiologist, intensivist, microbiologist, surgeons, micro or intensivist, surgeons. So two out of three clinicians must have agreed this is an infection. Um, look at the red line. This is in infected cases, CRP goes up. Uh, slowly, postoperatively, peaks up day three, almost 24 hours after we diagnose the infection clinically. And then when we start treatment, still the, 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 the numbers are high. This is median value, about 150 or 160. Even in the non-infected group, it goes high and it stays high. When we looked at the procalcitonin, the green line is the non-infected group, so goes up postoperative day one. But look at the in, in the infected group, it goes up most, most significantly, almost seven and a half microgram per liter compared to two microgram per liter. But almost 24 hours before or when we diagnosed infections clinically. And again, when we treat, the drop is much more dramatic. It goes back to normal when you do source control and you treat with antibiotics. Uh, so we think it's a better marker again in this group of patients to decide on antibiotics and also where to stop them. Uh, but I wish it was that easy. Most of these patients, they get splenectomy as part of their uh, operation. And we found out even in the non-infected groups, if you have splenectomy, your procalcitonin shots up, and I don't know why. So again, it's not ideal, but it's, if you don't have splenectomy in this group, we could use it as a stewardship tool. Mortality, is it a good prognostic marker? Philip Schutz, uh, who is the procalcitonin guru from Switzerland, he said if you have 80% reduction by day three, your survival is much better compared to if you don't see that 80% reduction from the original value. There are other studies, they say if you're persistently above one microgram per liter, despite, su despite supportive treatment, source control, antibiotics, you have uh, uh, guaranteed mortality. We haven't seen that in our hospital. But uh, I, I'll, I'll come back to prognosis and uh, maybe there is another marker that aid us uh, better in determinants. So what's the barrier? Why it hasn't been 
uh, more widely used, at least in the UK. Uh, lots of reasons. Cost is very important. CRP costs about 20p, Procalcitonin is about £10 to £20. So it's, uh, availability, test limitations. Some people do not trust it, and there are some limitations of the test. Lack of trust and experience. And there are studies recently in America. I think it was a negative study, just because they didn't have experience, they didn't follow the protocol that they have derived for the study. Uh, I think it was down to experience and education. And some say lack of guidance, uh, how best to integrate or integrate procalcitonin into clinical practice. Um, recently, an, an international group uh, came up with these guidelines, how to use procalcitonin as a stewardship tool. And uh, the paper is available free on, online. And there are guidelines how to use it outside ICU in mild to moderate cases and how to use it in, 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 in ICU and in, in severe illness to aid you uh, uh, decide whether to give antibiotic or not and how long to continue within the clinical context. But I think one major thing in, in, in I think in NHS is organizational constipators where they reject change or they don't like change and that they could put barriers in whatever change one suggest. <coughs> Learning from negative studies, um, so there are negative studies, not all the studies are positive for procrastination. So, so Jensen in, in um, Denmark, the PATH trial, this was an ICU study they want to see whether survival would improve if the trend of procalcitonin is on the way up and they broaden the spectrum of antibiotic. And in fact, they didn't see that. Uh, there were more side effects when they gave the broader spectrum antibiotic. And they discouraged it. And they say, in fact, there are other reasons why this procalcitonin might be going up. It's not antibiotic failure. It's source control. So we need to look for source as well as maybe change, change of antibiotics. Uh, PROACT trial, I, uh, this was the ED trial I mentioned from the States, the multicenter trial. It was a negative uh, outcome for procalcitonin because they didn't follow their protocol. Uh, more than 75% of the cases had low PCT, despite that they were given antibiotics. The case severity were low. The case um, uh, inclusion, so in two and a half years, a center for pneumonia, including 26 studies. So again, I, I, think, I, I think there was a tweet, um, this is how not to do a study um, uh, on, on Twitter. Um, the, uh, another trial looking at COPD, the procalcitonin arm, where they dis decide antibiotic based on high or low procalcitonin. The procalcitonin arm had a higher mortality. <laughs> but if you look at the timeliness of antibiotics, if you exclude those patients who got the antibiotics longer than an hour, survival was much better, in fact, in the procalcitonin group. Similarly, the high temp is another ED, ED study from Holland. They didn't find it useful. It was safe, but wasn't useful. The inclusion criteria, they included everyone. So, as I mentioned from the beginning, if you use it as a box ticking, you would lose your predictive value of the test. And a cellulitis, if you have someone with cellulitis, why do you do procalcitonin? You treat cellulitis. If the procalcitonin is low, which it often is, in localized infection, you don't need to waste 10 pound test or 20 pound test, just treat the patient. Um, this is just an example of all these are group A, skin and soft tissue infection, the mild cellulitis, still mildly raised to a severe whole limb cellulitis to a necrotizing fasciitis, which is 26. Uh, microgram per liter. But you don't need procalcitonin to tell you these patients need surgical interventions or, or antibiotics. Um, we found for localized infection, especially bone and joint infection, synovial procalcitonin is better than serum procalcitonin. These are a group of only s small cases, 17 cases. We have now about 20 cases. The, the blue bar, the blue triangles are those who genuinely have a prosthetic joint infection. And they have higher procalcitonin, median value 3.15 microgram per liter, compared to the red dots, which are the uninfected or aseptic loosening, they have almost undetectable procalcitonin in the synovia. So we think that's a better way of measuring whether there's a PJI uh, or, or not, a prosthetic joint infection or not. 
Um, I'm not sure about the last triangle. That was a coagulase negative staph in two out of six specimens. It was deemed to be infection, but I question <coughs> that. I think that was a, a, an aseptic leucine. That was a contaminant. I mentioned about test limitation. So procalcitonin could go up after surgery, after pregnancy, or with pregnancy. Um, the neonate, they relative have relatively high procalcitonin physiologically. Patients with autoimmune diseases, uh, but anything like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, in our experience, <coughs> anything above one microgram in those cases could be significant of infection. Patients with severe burn and patients who are on immunomodulators. Um, Weak or false negatives, any atypical infection, mycoplasma, chlamydia, legionella, Lyme disease, TB, syphilis, you wouldn't get rise of procalcitonin. <coughs> false negative in immunocompromise, we have seen quite a lot of false negative in truly septic patients, HIV, AIDS, or as immunocompromised. So you, you need to be caution, cautious when you, when you are using it in those cases. <coughs> Patients with multiple transfusion, with true staph aureus bacteremia, the negative procalcitonin, you are measuring someone else's blood. So again, in those situations, you need to be <coughs> careful. <coughs> but you could combine it to other markers, like accelerate pheno, which my colleague Steve Kidd is going to talk about, um, or momentum diagnostic. Momentum is um, it's a PCR-based, um, and, and we have evaluated this in Hampshire hospitals. Um, it would give you uh, uh, we might mention about negative blood culture report within 48 hours and then second negative blood culture within five days. The momentum technology, uh, a cognitive technology, a PCR base, it would tell you with high certainty when it's negative within 12 hours. So instead of 48 hours or five days, it would tell you this blood culture remains negative uh, within 12 hours. It includes some, some steps, some incubation steps. But uh, again, you can inc incorporate biomarkers and modern technology to aid your diagnostic as well as stewardship. So I go back to proidium. So that was about procalcitonin and how it helped us uh, as a prognostic tool or triaging tool. I was given this title of talk to, to speak in ISICAM, International Symposium of Intensive Care in Emergency Medicine. Who should be admitted and who could go home in emergency? I said, you guys are asking the wrong person. I'm a microbiologist. They said, no, you'd like to tell us you as a microbiologist from diagnostic. Um, so I searched for the topic and I asked many people. I didn't get a straight answer. The best answer I got was from my son, who is seven years old. He said, daddy, the doctor must decide. I said, that's easy. I could just stop and say that the doctor must decide any question. Uh, but I wish it was... Uh, uh, this presentation was in Belgium. They didn't appreciate the joke <laughs> yeah? um, in, in March. So I wish it was that easy. Uh, as my son again says, it's really complicated. Uh, so it's complex uh, and full of conflicts. Conflict, yeah. So staffing issues, related to staff experience, um, patient demography, age is, plays a major role, targets in the UK, bed pressures, funding, Time, time of the year, bank holiday, is it a weekend? And then various other sequence, sepsis recognition versus antibiotic stews. So it's not very easy. And there are no guidelines uh, to tell us, or, or biomarkers or clinical scoring to predict which patient would become worse or as a disease progression, or whether we could safely send a patient home uh, based on any clinical scoring or, or biomarkers. Uh, so we, we looked at uh, evaluating all the above biomarkers, procalcitonin, white cell CRP, lactic, pro-ADM, pro-adrenomodulin, and various clinical scoring, SARS, NEWS, SOFA, QuickSOFA, CAP65, plus various other markers, liver functions, urea, creatinine, to see whether we could identify a potential marker with a clinical scoring or markers with clinical scoring to help us to predict who would get worse and who would probably go home uh, safely. So we did a, a, a study, a, an observational and then a validati validation study among nine ED centers. Um, so Basingstoke, uh, Winchester, 
at Hampshire Hospital, there's one. There were seven European centers and one American. Uh, I know a little about statistics, but there was a very clever statistician who looked at various stats for us. And we looked at two outcomes, disease progression, which was a composite of 28-day mortality, ICU admission, and hospitalization more than 10 days, uh, versus uncomplex in or uncomplicated infection. So the end point is you are alive at 10, 28, 28 days, you haven't been to ICU, and you are in hospital for less than 10 days. And we looked at over 2,000 patients. There, as I said, there were the, the, the prospective and a retrospective cause. And we, we, we looked at the impact of mortality as well as whether potential avoid admission and disease progression. What we found, all the markers and the clinical scorings that we looked at were significantly higher in the, those patients who died versus the ones who survived, which is not, not a su surprise. But before I go to the detail, I show this. This is just in patients when they fulfilled, these are patients with suspicion of infection, not suspicion of sepsis, suspicion of infection group. If they don't fulfill sepsis two or three, their admission was about 57%. Uh, their mortality was about 2%, just under 2%, and ICU admission zero. If they fulfill sepsis two, the old definition, you see the hospitalization increases and the <coughs> ICU admission increases, their mortality increases. If they just fulfill sepsis three, again higher, but if they fulfill both definitions, sepsis 2 and sepsis 3, they even higher hospitalization rates, higher ICU admissions, and higher mortality. So they're just telling us no definition is accurate. I think Tom mentioned, uh, if you decide based on clinical diagnosis, it's not safe. So that's just... So briefly about Proadrenomodulin, again, is a, 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 a relatively novel marker. It's a peptide, it's again, related to the calcitonin family. Um, it's been extracted from, from uh, human pheochromocytoma and has been studied since early 90s. Um, and you could measure its byproduct uh, of ADM. It's called mid-regional product, uh, proadrenomodulin, M-proADM. In some literature, they labeled bioproADM, so it's the same marker, MD proADM or bioproADM. What does it do? The net effect of what it does is high potential positive inotrope, antimicrobial, and anti inflammatory effect. And uh, that's interesting because, again, the more you have it, the worse the outcome, despite being an anti inflammatory and antimicrobial. I took this from the Thermo Fisher, the manufacturer because it's a very non-specific marker. So it's not a specific marker for infection, but it's a very sensitive marker for how critically ill you are. And based on various and large number of studies in animals and human in Europe, they categorize you into three categories based on this traffic light system. If you're level beyond 0.75, you're in the green zone, you're fine, you probably don't need to come to hospital. If you're in the orange zone, uh, you are moderately ill, you need to come to the hospital, you need to be under observation. If you're in the red, oh, you might need a HDU ICU care. And if you're constantly in the red, your mortality is almost certainly guaranteed based on these studies. So in our group, as I said, all the markers went up in the mortality or, or in the patients who died. But pro-ADM at a cutoff of 1.54, that put you in the red, red zone. They had the highest mortality. Um, so that's better than SOFA, QuickSOFA, NEWS, uh, and, and PC procalcitonin. I, I show this, this because it's interesting. SOFA less than two. So there was a, a, over 580 patients, 585 patients, SOFA less than two. For those who had pro-ADM less than 1.54, their mortality was 0.2 compared to 12 if you're pro-ADM, same SOFA less than two, but your pro-ADM is uh, uh, higher than 1.54. Look at the hospitalization, two days versus nine days. This is just based on the pro-ADM, statistically significant. For quick SOFA, again, your quick SOFA is low, less than two, but if your pro-ADM is high, 
17% mortality versus 0.5 if your proidium is low. Your hospitalization, three versus seven day. Quick sofa was slightly better, in fact, than use, than use uh, the, the national early warning score system. Again, your news is low, less than four, or four or less. If your pro EDM is high, your mortality higher, and, and your uh, admission uh, hospitalization is higher. And that was true for ICU admission. And if you, if you look at whether we could safely send patients home if they're in the green zone, so we looked at, again, all the biomarkers and the clinical scoring. Again, at a cutoff of 87.87, which is still in, uh, slightly above the green zone, you have higher sensitivity, higher likelihood ratio, positive predictive value to safely send the patient home from ED with a safety net. I mentioned backstop in Belgium. They didn't found it impressive there. So with the <laughs> backstop, you could say you could go home, but you could come back in if you felt unwell. And if you look at conventional discharge on this side, so among 1,000 patients, the discharge rate from ED immediately was 22%. Readmission was 5%. If you include the pro-ADM, if you do a virtual discharge based on the low pro-ADM in the same group, your discharge would be about 30%, so 1.5% increase. So 50% increase, and your readmission rate would be much lower, 3.5%. When we validate in the validation group, there's under 1,000 patients, the discharge almost doubled. So this was the conventional discharge, 20% versus 40% in the pro-ADM, readmission 5% versus 36 There was one case who died here in, in the community. That patient would have been discharged. Based upon the pro-EDM, this patient would have been admitted. Probably would have still died in hospital, but would have been discharged and died in the community. <coughs> Limitations of our study, so absence of sequential markers and clinical scoring, especially in the validation group. The lack of data in the validation group. Um, um, we don't have a health economics. We don't know how much it costs. So there's no price on, on the test at the moment. However, it's... Um, the large, largest study, to our knowledge, from ED using a biomarker that could aid, uh, not assisting in clinicians to predict disease progression, but maybe also assisting them to safely discharge with a safety net. Uh, and, and it was multicentral. That I regarded as a strength as well as weakness. The 10-day, composite 10-day, if it was up to certain hospital, I would have calculate that as three days, but there were hospitals, their practices to admit people for longer. And uh, that's why the 10 day was, was chosen. And it confirms some other smaller studies, specifically in UTI and, 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 and pneumonia with similar, similar cutoffs. And when I looked, in fact, there is now a monoclonal antibody against adrenomodulin and has been trialed in Holland. Uh, and it's in fact, they're doing now phase, phase, th phase three trials and they say it's very promising in sepsis and improving sepsis outcome. Um, Adricizumab, so watch the space. So I think going back to the question who can be admitted and who can go home, I think my son is right. A clinician or a doctor must decide, and that could be a doctor or an advanced nurse practitioner or a senior nurse, doesn't have to be a doctor. But whatever we do, I think we should do it in a clinical context and with a safety net. And at the moment, we, had, we, we have the approval to trial it in real life in our uh, acute admission unit on the Basingstoke side, and based on this traffic light system, again, based on the original found findings from our study, uh, news less than five, if, if you're in the green zone, you could go home. If you're in the amber zone, you need to come in for observation and repeat of the test. If you are in the red zone, you might even need ICU admission. Uh, so hopefully that would start in June and see what, what happens in, in real life. And thank you very much. <laughs>